As the church, our enemies are not Muslim extremists or an activist judge. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Paul teaches us, don't wage war as the world does. That's not how we fight. Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And the word schemes here is, is, is really translated, and it's from where we get our word methods. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's methods. And it applies to something very specific rather than generic, that there are methods out there. That as a follower of Jesus, you're going to be targeted. And there is a strategy in place to separate you from God. Satan has a method. Devil uses two primary things to do that. He uses temptation. Anybody ever been tempted? Yeah. And he uses accusation. Anybody ever been accused? He loves those things. And they're always rooted in lies and they're rooted in lies about you, and they're rooted in lies about God. And Satan has strategies to deploy these weapons of temptation and accusations. I'd like to look at a couple of those so that we're not aware, unaware of the devil's schemes. I'll put them in military terms because we started out with a military scenario. First strategy I think the devil uses is to divide and conquer. He uses this within the church. He knows if he can separate and divide us on things that are matters of interpretation or preferences, that we're vulnerable. I have heard more churches fight over music. I was actually at a funeral one time where the preacher said he didn't know whether the guy was saved because he was a smoker. And so Satan divides and conquers, and it's definitely his strategy, and it's a truth because a house divided can't stand. Anybody ever hear the word blitzkrieg? Tom, you probably know that term. Yeah, it's using a concentrated force that comes quickly and at just the right time. Maybe you can identify this. Maybe it's something you didn't even see coming. In fact, maybe it's something you thought, man, I'm really okay here. And so you let down your guard. You said, no way I'll ever cheat on my wife. And then at that sales meeting with a colleague, well. And then on that message from a past girlfriend on social media, hey, can we just get together for coffee? Well. And maybe you still can't believe it happened. Here's another strategy the enemy uses. It's called to counter. Remember from last Sunday, we said we're on the offensive. So Satan counters. You may be tired of banging at the gates. And in that moment of tired, Satan counters. Anybody remember Job's wife? Yeah, as we start to read Job, she's doing pretty well in the book of Job. But her pretty well kind of wears off and she eventually tells Job to curse God and die. Maybe that's where you're at. You were doing pretty well in offense against the gates of hell and then and remission turned into now it's back. And so we stop banging on the gates. Here's another strategy the enemy uses. Anyone ever hear the terms shock and awe? Brian, that's what happens every time the Vikings play the Eagles. The Eagles experience shock and awe. This is when you're so shocked by the means of the enemy that your fear causes you to just stop playing. Spouse leaves you out of nowhere. The absolute love of your life 
found somebody else. Or maybe a diagnosis, one without a medical cure. So shocked, so scared, and, and, and you're down and out. Anybody ever hear of the Trojan horse? Yeah, everybody knows about that. When the Greeks conquered the ancient city of Troy, they did it by giving them a huge wooden horse. And they thought it was a peace offering and they bring it inside the gates of the city and at night, Greek soldiers come out of the horse and attack the city from the inside. I think the enemy loves this strategy. You get something and you think, this is really good. It's what I've always wanted. This is what I've been missing out on. This satisfies every desire of my heart. But is it just, is it just maybe a, a bait? And maybe there's a hook. I've always wanted wealth and now I have wealth. Lost my marriage, lost my family in getting it, but it's what I always wanted. I know a man who made it all the way in his organization to CEO. And all he ended up was wealthy and alone and nothing spiritually. Distraction is another strategy. If your intention is somewhere else, you may be vulnerable. Because sometimes we think we're on, well, we think we're on a playground. So we don't notice that the battle is being waged all around us. So we need to understand these things in order to be prepared for them. So I'll ask again, playground or battleground? What's our mentality? Sometimes we're obvious and we know it's spiritual warfare. Other times we have a hard time recognizing it and seeing it. Before I started this series, I was talking to a preacher colleague about preaching on spiritual warfare. And he said, you ready for that? Yeah, why? Eh, just be prepared for the attack. Nah, I'm good. This has been a strange week for me. I had two issues to deal with in my secular job that in 30 years I've never had to deal with really heavy stuff issues affecting employees and family for a long time, all on me. And then twice this week I had the preacher dream. Anybody ever tell you of a dream they have of being at some ceremony like a graduation and they're up giving the speech and they find that they're completely naked? <laughs> well, here's the preacher's dream. It's being in the pulpit and finding out that you're completely naked. Now, mine is a variation of that. Mine is arriving somewhere to preach and being completely unprepared. In many of these dreams, I've forgotten my notes, I've forgotten my Bible. Many times I didn't even know I was going to preach. I guess I'm okay with being naked. The dream is frightening though to me. I wake up in cold sweats from this dream. I had a variation of that dream twice this week. And in my mind, I'm not connecting this to a sermon series. Actually, I'm connecting it to the burritos I had at McDonald's. <laughs> Wednesday night this, this week, past week, I was about a third done my message when my computer just shut down. It's about a 15 year old Dell not so high tech, lost everything, had to start over. So if you think your computer is demon possessed and it's not a Mac, it probably is. I got two messages this week from Sarah. You know Sarah, right? Telling me she's going to be staying at the Hampton Inn in Jamestown, New York, a couple miles from where I stay up there. And although we've never met, I should text her back because I might be interested in getting to know her. FBI also sent me several messages this week telling me that a warrant was about to be issued for my arrest. I can stop it by sending them money. 
I sent them a message back and told them my picture's already hanging in the post office. The warrant doesn't scare me at all. I had a terrible time sleeping this week. Awful. Ever have a tough time sleeping? Especially when you have so much to get done. It really wears you out. I sent out my message outline for this message to the great people that put this stuff up on the screen at 2 o'clock in the morning because I was up. <coughs> Didn't get much sleep, and maybe that's why I had a headache all week. Driving home Friday night from western New York was a nightmare. I got started my five-hour drive at 6.30 p.m. Usually I leave by 5.30 p.m., so I'm an hour late to begin with. I had to pull over at rest stops two times to sleep. It was early Saturday morning I finally made it home. I pulled into the driveway, I shut off my car, I sat there for a few minutes. I won't even include what this morning was like. And then at that point, I thought, I wonder if there's more to this. More than just the physical flesh and blood side of life. And I began to fight a different kind of battle. And I started to pray out loud. It is helpful for me to pray out loud. I was suggested to you as well because it focuses you just on one thing. If you pray with your eyes closed to yourself, your mind wanders. And so I asked God, God, lead me in battle. Have me keep banging at the gates no matter what. Now, you may be saying right now, Steve, the week you just described sounds like a vacation compared to how the enemy is on me and my family. Agreed. The Bible tells us that we stand firm not only in our own strength, but we stand firm in the mighty power of God. That's the power to demolish strongholds. And so by our prayer, with this wonderful gospel, by grace and worship, by gathering together with other believers who can encourage us, who can hold us up in their powerful prayers, we stay strong in the Lord. By our service, by our sacrifice, we keep banging at the gates. By our love, we keep banging at the gates. Second Kings chapter 6 has one of my favorite stories that captures this kind of thought. Let's look at verse 15. We read about the king of Aram, who was an enemy of Israel. And he wanted to destroy the prophet Elijah, one of the prophets of God. So he sends this entire army, whole army, to kill this one prophet and his servant. Way, way overkill. So they find what house he's in, and they just surround him and his servant. Verse 15. When the servant of the man of God, when the servant of Elijah, when the servant of the man of God got up and went and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asks. And Elisha responds with these incredible words. Verse 16, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Say what? Those who are with us are more greater than those who are with them. And the servant's like, there's just two of us. It's just you and me. And and there's a whole army out there. And in verse 17, Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. 
Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I don't want you to miss this in verse 16. Elisha says, those who are with us are more, are greater than those who are with them. And here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say those who are with us are more than them. It says those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Those who are with them. You see, what is being described here is a spiritual battle. It's us against them. There are those who are with us and there are those who are with them. And Elisha prays, open my servant's eyes that he may see. In the end, God blinds that army that surrounded him. Elisha prayed and the army was blinded and he led them to captivity and then released them. That's what I want us to pray for this church. Open my eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see. That we would recognize that there is an enemy, but that we would also recognize that those who are with us are more, are greater than those who are with them. That we would understand that our power and strength is found in Jesus the Christ and our victory is certain. So we don't have to be afraid. We can live with courage and confidence because of the power of Jesus. Isn't that what we talked about this morning, Brian? Who it's all about. So... So if you're on a playground, can I ask you to come into the battleground? And for those who are a little weary, pray for God's strength. Pray that out loud. Have this group of believers here hold you up in prayer and encouragement and love. And if you are surrounded by the enemy, Understand that those who are with you are more, are greater than those who are with them. We win. And the gates of hell cannot overcome it. That's right.